Buongiorno, Amsterdam. Um, hello, Amsterdam. Sorry, I don't speak Italian or Dutch. Are you all Dutch? Show me your hands if you're Dutch. Excellent. It's a pleasure to be back drinking your amazing Dutch beers. I tried uh, Yeneva last night, but after about five pints, I didn't like it anymore. Um, so I'm here to talk about, uh, it's a World Wide Web, not a wealthy Western web. I'm Bruce Lawson. I work for Opera. I'm the deputy CTO. I know deputy chief sounds a bit weird, but what it really means is I get lots of extra work, but no more money. Um, and I'm an HTML alcoholic. I discovered the web in 1999. I was living and working as a primary school teacher in Bangkok, in Thailand, and uh, I got sick. And in the hospital, they diagnosed me with uh, multiple sclerosis, <clears throat> excuse me, MS. And it was very, very difficult for me to find English language information about my MS, because they don't have it in countries near the equator. Um, but when I was recovering and I could walk again, I noticed that opposite my apartment in Bangkok, there was this thing called an internet cafe. So I went in and paid my $1 for one hour, and the guy showed me how to open the internet. And I went to Alta Vista, which was like Google, but steam-powered, and typed in multiple sclerosis, and found this website in the UK called Julie's Joint. It was a forum where people from all around the world, from Norway, Canada, France, the Netherlands, the UK, Australia, were collaborating and helping each other through their diagnosis. People from all around the world, using different kinds of computers, speaking different languages, using different kinds of devices, all just working together. And I knew then that this was an amazing new medium that we have, and I knew that I wanted to work on it. So in 2002, I returned to the UK, uh, set up a book publishing company, writing books about web standards. I worked with the Web Standards Project, I worked with the W3C, I worked with the British Standards Institute to write the standard for accessibility, and now I work for, oh, now I work for Opera. Um, but the theme for that is for the last 14 years, I've been trying in my own little way to make the web better, to make the web better for developers, because I was a developer, and you are developers, and I individually love each and every one of you. I want to make the web better for consumers, the people who use our websites. I want to make the web better for business owners, because they pay your wages, and they pay my salary, and I like paying my mortgage. That's a lie. I don't like paying my mortgage, but I do like having a house. And I want to make the web better for the next four billion people in the world who do not have web access because it very much changed my life and having lived in, I was born in Yemen, we lived in Africa, I lived in Asia for eight years. I've seen a lot of the world and I've seen how the web can really change people's lives. We know for a fact that one in 10 people who get access to the web are lifted out of poverty by the web. So. Earlier this year, the World Bank, that well-known hippie institution, uh, published a report called Digital Dividends. This is hard to see at the back, I'm sorry. There's 1.1 billion people like us who have high-speed internet. 3.2 billion in the world have internet access. 5.2 billion have mobile phones. 7 billion live within range of mobile coverage and the global population is 7.4 billion. Still, more than 50% of the world has no access to the web. And those people, sorry, those people live, as you might expect, in India and China, not because those are backward countries, simply because they're the biggest countries in the world. There you have Bangladesh, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Brazil, the Philippines, but also 51 million people in the USA have no web access. And this is important. I care because underneath this stupid hairstyle, I'm an, an old hippie. But it also matters to you because you need to ask yourself, 
Where do my next customers come from? Almost certainly, they will come from within this circle because there are more human beings alive today inside this circle than outside the circle. There are four billion people living in Asia. The United Nations predicts that by 2050, that will rise to five billion. By 2050, the population of Africa will double from one billion to two billion. By 2100, which is a little bit late for me, but maybe not for you, by 2100, the population of the world will peak at 11 billion people, of whom five billion will live in Africa. This, this alarms lots of people. They think, oh my God, everybody's gonna die in a terrible famine because Africa can't support five billion people. Don't be alarmed. Maps or the Mercator projection on maps lie to us. Africa is really big. You can fit China, the US, India, Eastern Europe, and the majority of Western Europe into Africa. There is, there is am, ample possibility of supporting five billion people there if the governments can get it right. The UN predicts that by 2100, when population peaks, 50% of the world will live in just these 10 countries, of which only one is what we consider to be the rich West now. So let's look at Asia, because that's the next big growth before Africa. Here's China. China's 1.3 billion people with a GDP growth of 7.7% on the last measurement. Uh, I don't know about GDP growth in the Netherlands, but the UK government would kill for a 7.7% GDP growth. In 2014, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, $2.9 billion was taken over the web in the US. On Double Eleven Day, the 11th of November, in China, 9.2 billion changed hands. And it's predicted that by 2019, $1 trillion will change hands in China over the web. Maybe some of those $1 trillion will be spent on the goods and services that you or your clients or your bosses offer. If you're interested in China, by the way, uh, tomorrow at 2.30 p.m., my good friend Lu Yu is doing a talk on Chinese web design and typography, if that would interest you. Then there's Indonesia, a country I've been lucky enough to visit twice. 250 million people, 5.8% GDP growth. It's made of thousands of islands, so 75% of people in Indonesia only have access to a 2G network, and 50% of smartphone owners report daily networking problems. But even so, Indonesia is the second biggest emitter of social networking messages on Facebook, Twitter, Vine, Line, etc. Bangladesh. Bangladesh is not often considered to be one of the Asian tiger economies, but it has a 7% GDP growth, 157 million people. It was the first country in South Asia to adopt cellular technology. And by 2011, by 2011, 50% of households in Bangladesh had access to a working mobile phone. And we have Myanmar, 53 million people and a massive 13% GDP growth, largely caused by the recent uh, moves towards democratization by their government. A side effect of that is that in Myanmar, in the last five years, the cost of a SIM card has dropped from 2,000 US dollars to $1.50. India the largest democracy on the planet, 1.2 billion people, 6.9% GDP growth. We expect, we expect the number of internet users to double from 190 to 400 million in 2018, and the internet will contribute $200 billion, 5% of the total GDP by 2020. So what do all these nations have in common? Uh, apart from China, because of the recently changed one child per couple policy, which has left a huge demographic hole in Chinese populations. The populations of these countries are young, and young people obviously have grown up with the web and are familiar with using the web. 
Another interesting thing, uh, a survey by the BBC, 56% of people in emerging and developing economies see themselves primarily as global citizens rather than national citizens, particularly in Nigeria, China, Peru, and India. Thank you to the BBC for permission for using this chart. It's encouraging to see that people in Spain find, think of themselves as global citizens and a bit sad for the UK where I'm from, Germany and Russia, but there we are. And I think seeing yourself as a global citizen means that you're automatically more willing and able to participate in the World Wide Web if we let them. All of the people in the emerging world are coming to the web on smartphones. There's already a generation of people who will never think of a computer as a beige tower with a separate monitor and a separate keyboard. They're coming on smartphones, they will graduate to tablets, maybe the kind of detachable tablets that you can add a keyboard to, but the day of the traditional PC is gone. And there's a more profound commonality. Uh, my company runs something called Opera Mini, which I'll talk about later. Uh, these are the top 10 web domains visited last month by people in the USA using Opera Mini. Search, stalking your high school sweetheart, that's Facebook. Uh, funny videos of kittens, YouTube, Wikipedia. So we have uncensored information, search, social networking, funny videos, etc. The top 10 handsets used last month in the US are predictably high-end. Apple, high-end Samsung. In the same time period in Nigeria, you have search, stalking your school, school day sweetheart, uh, funny videos, BBC, uncensored news. But the top 10 handsets in Nigeria are much lower end. Nokia, Asher's running Windows Phone, some Nokia's running Series 40, um, Infinix and Techno are low spec Android devices. And I can't show them because of time, but I have very similar stats for Indonesia and the Netherlands. What this shows us is that regardless of the networking environment, regardless of the hardware that you have, regardless of the disposable income you have to buy the hardware, people around the world want to consume similar kinds of goods and services. And maybe they will be your goods and services. So what can we do to make the web accessible to the 50% of the planet who don't yet have access? Excuse me. One of the things we could do is make better websites. And one of the things I can do as the deputy CTO of Opera is make better browsers. And we're trying to do that. This is a cake that my colleagues in our web technology team ate for our 2048th commit to Chromium. High-end Opera browsers use the same code base as Google Chrome, and uh, Opera is the third biggest committer, some months the second biggest committer, with Google and Samsung. Uh, the Google guys are heavily focused on 60 frames per second performance, and so are we, but because Opera's been going for 15 years and most of our market share is in emerging economies, we have particular expertise in making the binaries smaller, more memory efficient, and more power efficient. So that's what we're doing in Chromium. And of course, because Chromium's open source project, everybody gets the benefit of that. Something else we're doing in the web standards community, I've been working very hard with my counterparts in Google Chrome and most recently in Mozilla Firefox on something called progressive web apps. Progressive web apps is a new way of making app-like experiences on the web. So we know that in the West, people love to install apps. When you say install, a consumer doesn't understand what that means. To a consumer, installation is you go somewhere, you press install, and an icon appears on the home screen that they can tickle into life with the digits. So progressive Web Apps allows you to do this. 
It's a much better user experience to have an icon for your web app on the home page than a browser icon, and then they have to go into the bookmarks. So with a progressive web app, you can set an icon defined by you as the developer for the brand or the web app or the site. They can launch full screen portrait or landscape because consumers like that of native apps. But crucially, a progressive web app lives on the web. You don't have to download massive amounts of data. They live on a web server. If you're as old as me, you might call this a website. And indeed they are. They're websites progressively enhanced so that in browsers that understand it, they have the user experience of native apps. And it's important they live on the web. We know Google's research last year, the average smartphone user has 36 apps installed. One in four are used every day. That's mostly social networking and gaming. And one in four are never used. But they take up space. In Opera, we did a quick test. We installed the native apps for Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, etc. That took 460 megabytes of storage on the user's device. The web apps for the same websites took up cumulatively a total of one megabyte on the user's device. And that matters. Downloading a 20 megabyte APK over 2G, which is what the majority of the world have access to, takes 30 minutes and very often craps out over flaky networks. If you've ever been to Asia or Africa and tried to download 20 megabytes, it can take all day. With space limited, because lower spec devices in the emerging and developing world, they come with less storage space, you are asking the user to choose between his or her personal photo collection and your app. Is your app better than photographs of their girlfriend, boyfriend, and children? Ask yourself the question, and really ask the question. For you, your mobile device is probably the most personal device you have. If somebody ran off with your computer, it's a bit of a bummer, you have a backup. If your mobile device is stolen today, don't look at me, I've already got one. If your mobile device is stolen today, you're gonna be really pissed off. It's your most personal device. And it's exactly the same with people in Africa too. In Africa, people use their mobiles primarily for phone calls, text messages, missed calls. This is when uh, you pass an advertising hoarding and it says, interested? Send us a missed call. You ring the number once, you hang up, they call you back so it's not wasting your phone bill. Games, music, transferring airtime. Transferring airtime is a way of paying people. Instead of giving cash or using a credit card, you transfer them X dollars worth of airtime to their number. And photos and videos. Just like everybody else, for people in Africa, their mobile device is a very personal thing. They have less space than you. They might not want your app. As um, Birdly said, in their sad blog post, why you shouldn't bother making a mobile app. We didn't stand a chance. We were fighting with both our competitors and other apps for a few more megabytes on people's devices. So with progressive web apps, you download very little. You simply download a manifest and the icon for the home screen. And the manifest is pointed to from your HTML by a link element. Browsers that don't understand it will just ignore it and carry on and show a website rather than a web app. Nobody has a worse experience. And that's what a manifest looks like. Very small, JSON, text only. When the user installs it, with they click a plus icon in Opera and choose add to home screen. In Chrome for Android, they choose the menu add to home screen, Firefox are still implementing, so I don't know how they will do it. When the user installs the web app, it lives on the home screen like this, with your icon, with your name. They tickle it into life, a splash screen appears while you are connecting, and then the app shows. This one is in standalone mode. It still has the Android soft keys and the status bar, but if you want to, in the manifest, you can say display full screen and it will take the full screen. You can say display portrait, you can say 
display landscape. An icon on the home screen tickled to life with a digit that just opens up full screen. To the consumer, it's indistinguishable from a native app, but it takes up little to no space on their device. The manifest is easy to write. Most of this information is already in your website in meta tags. So with my friend Stuart Langridge, I wrote a manifest generator. It will just scour the HTML in your site and attempt to write a manifest that you can download and then FTP to the server or copy and paste. If you want to see some progressive web apps, and interestingly, lots of them are coming from India and Indonesia at the moment, pwa.rocks is a, a, a crowdsourced list of progressive web apps. Really good progressive web apps are rewarded in Chrome and Opera for Android. If your web app is secure, can work offline, and the user has shown repeated engagement, the browser will offer this banner, do you want to save me to home screen? As a developer, you need to do nothing. This is given by the browser to prompt the user that this is a really good progressive web app. Flipkart Lite. Flipkart is a really big e-commerce uh, company based in Bengaluru in uh, India. I was very lucky enough to be at the launch of their progressive web app. A year ago, they decided to close down their mobile site and point everybody to the app store. And of all the people who took the trouble to open their browser, type in Flipkart, hit return, only 4% downloaded the native app. So they reversed policy, good on them, and they made a progressive web app. They report with the progressive web app 40% returning visitors week over week, an increase of 63% conversions from home screen visits, and three times the spent brow time browsing by a consumer in their web app. And they did this because one of their engineering guys told me, we want Flipkart Lite available on every phone over every flaky network in India. This is the way forward for getting an app-like experience to people who have lower spec devices. They live on the web, so the minute you make a change to the app, the next person who goes there sees the change. There's no, hey, there's a new version to install, no waiting for people to go to a coffee shop to connect to Wi-Fi and download if they ever do. It's instantly updatable because it lives on the web. Thus, it requires no app store or gatekeeper. And crucially, it's a normal website on Opera Mini, Safari, and Windows phones that don't yet support progressive web apps. Because it's on the web, they're searchable, indexable, and linkable. And due to a new technology, they can work offline. And working offline is a new thing. I don't have time to go into the technology. I, I spent a two, I spent two days at a conference learning about this. But it's so exciting that I've used my Photoshop skills to make a, a logo for it, which I've offered to the W3C. And this technology that allows web apps to go offline is called Service Worker. <laughs> Look at that. I'm going to leave it up here just a little bit too long, because this is going to save you money at a coffee shop later. <laughs> Look at the cat, look into the cat's eyes, look deep into its eyes, listen to my voice, use opera, and wake up. Okay, <laughs> service workers, I don't have time to go into the mechanics of it, it's JavaScript, it gives you massive power, but you have to write it. It doesn't do anything magically, you have to write this. In a pre-service worker world, you're in a browser, you type in a URL and you don't have a connection, the browser goes, sorry. With service workers, they sit in between the browser and the network. And when you go to a URL, the service worker can detect you're offline and take some kind of remedial action. You have to code this, but for example, if you imagine you're writing a webmail client, of course, if you're not connected, you can't send or receive emails, but the service worker might allow you to draft emails, delete emails, move them into folders, a much better user experience than a sorry message from the browser. Service workers, 
also give you push notifications which are proven to enhance engagement with sites and brands, and background sync. So when you do go offline, you can sync all the data. To me, service workers are like this, game-changing. Something else we've done is responsive images. In 2011, thank you, in 2011, everybody I spoke to at conferences told me their most pressing problem as a developer was sending huge, beautiful images to retina displays, which then was wasting loads of bandwidth for people with non-retina displays or tiny Nokia screens. Worse still, <clears throat> if you're sending down these huge images, you're not only wasting bandwidth, but those smaller devices have to compress the image down and resample it, etc. That takes CPU cycles, and CPU cycles take time and, crucially, eat battery. So I was a bit hungover, and I wrote about it on my blog, and I came up with a straw man idea called Picture. And my idea was... I'm going to use a computer science term here. My idea was a bit shit. And, but it wasn't totally shit. There was just enough goodness for cleverer people than me who work for the Filament Group in Boston, who work for Mozilla, who work for Google Chrome, some of my colleagues in Opera. They took my strawman idea and made it a real thing. And I'm delighted that it's now in every major browser, even including Safari and iOS, and it allows you to say, if you are a black and white screen, if you are a small screen, have this version of the image. If you have a high DPI screen, have this version of the image, sending the right sized image to the right device. And that's really important, because we know that images on the web are massive. Last month, averaged over the Alexa top million websites, the average web page, not app, not site, the average web page was 2.3 meg, of which 1.4 meg are images. And responsive images allows you to reduce the number, reduce the file size of the images you send down the wire. Because not only do you delay rendering of your sites with big images, but you cost people money. The affordability report in 2014 said, in rich nations, we pay between 1% and 2% of our monthly income on mobile broadband. In the emerging economies, it's about 10%. Or well, to put that in perspective, to afford a 500 megabyte data plan takes one hour of minimum wage work in Germany. It takes five hours work to afford entry-level broadband in the USA, and in Brazil, it takes 34 hours of work to afford 500 megabytes of data. So if you are wasting people's bandwidth with unnecessarily large images, you're delaying rendering of your site, you're using up their data plan, and you are making them do more work, and that is not fair. Something else people have in <coughs> the emerging and developing world are network problems. Connectivity isn't good. And one of the ways people get around this are proxy browsers. I'm going to talk to you about Opera Mini, not because I want you to go and use it, because I want you to understand what 280 million people in the world use. Uh, and other proxy browsers are available. Uh, today, Sienta Mobile released this report. I'm grateful for them for giving me a preview and letting me use the graph. But Opera Mini globally is 42% market share of proxy browsers. Opera Turbo, which is a lighter compression, 9%. There's Chrome, you see Web, Puffin, and Silk, etc. We wrote Opera Mini to work on feature phones in 2005, because feature phones simply do not have the processing power to render a website. When our product manager was clearing his desk, he found all these devices, all of which run Opera Mini. And Opera Mini is basically a thin client on a device, and this server farm. This server farm is called Thor. It lives in Iceland. It's powered by hydroelectricity, and it's cooled by water from glaciers. And Thor, as you know, has a hammer. 
And when Thor, when you request a website, Thor will compress it down by up to 90%. So that means the user gets 10 times as many websites for his or her data plan, and they arrive faster. <coughs> Last week, we also started blocking ads on Thor. And ads, there's so many ads now on the web that just by blocking ads, we add an extra 40% of speed and save 14% more data. And that 14% of 34 hours, that's saving somebody half a day's work just by blocking ads. Thus, it uses 14% less battery in India and 89% less data. Battery matters. In somewhere like India, at peak times, demand for electricity outstrips supply by 10%. This means many areas get what the Indians euphemistically call load shedding, which is actually power cuts. And if you're spending two hours on a bus in Mumbai to go to work for 10 hours, two hours back on a bus, you get home and you have no power, you really are grateful for websites that do not eat your battery. Interestingly, this has led to a whole new industry. A third of... <clears throat> 30% of annual smartphone sales through India's largest retailer come bundled with a battery pack. It was only 1% two years ago. Your websites are using too much power, and that's pissing people off. Thus, Opera Mini does lots of transactions. 120,000 transactions a second. We compressed 23 petabytes last month. To put that into perspective, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN does 600 million particle collisions a second. They collect data, and they collect 30 petabytes of data annually. We compressed 23 petabytes last month. And consequently, Opera Mini has many, many users in emerging and developing economies because it saves data and it saves time, as do all the other proxy browsers. Other proxy browsers are available. What's interesting is that the Opera Mini servers are nowhere near the target users. We have a server farm in China because of Great Firewall, one here in Amsterdam, four in Iceland, one in East Coast America, one in West Coast America. When I grew up, if you were doing a big download, it always said, choose the server nearest to you. But Opera Mini servers are not near the consumer. And here's why. In the emerging world, networks are as congested as this truck that I photographed in Rajasthan in uh, February. So, I'm gonna skip because I'm running out of time. Imagine you're in Cape Town. A user in Cape Town makes a request for your site. That one request goes over the congested networks to our server farm in East Coast America. East Coast America serves Africa with Opera Mini. And then we make the 60 requests that the average web page makes for images, CSS, JavaScript, over a fast network close to the servers of your website. We render it, we compress it down in something that's like a PDF. We call it OBML, Opera Binary Markup Language. And that is sent as one binary blob back to the consumer. And the fact that it's one binary blob means it has an excellent chance of getting through. When I was in Chennai in India two months ago, a lot of people told me that Opera Mini was the only thing that worked during the flooding there because of this single binary blob that comes down the wire. If you're developing for emerging markets as a tangent, anybody a designer? Don't be shy. Don't do this. In Thailand, if you write somebody's name in red, you are wishing them dead. Now, I am not an MBA, but I'm not sure that is the way to a productive business relationship with somebody. Similarly, don't do this. Never ask for a Christian name, of course, but don't require a given name and a family name. Tens of millions of people in, in Indonesia have one name. This is my friend who works for Opera Indonesia. Her Twitter handle is only Putri. Her name is Putri. One name. And if you require people to make up or lie about their names, I would submit that is not the way to a respectful business relationship. There are tech constraints for lower spec markets too. 
With proxy browsers, everything happens on the server. So everything needs user interaction. Everything needs a server round trip. JavaScript in Opera Mini runs for five seconds on page load, and then we kill it in order to get it fast to the user. JavaScript-only APIs do not work. For designers, we don't always preserve your design. We don't preserve rounded corners or gradients because we would have to convert those into a bitmap, which would bloat the download size rather than compress it. We do not show CSS or SVG animations because those require CPU cycles, and that eats people's battery, and people do not like it if you waste their battery. We don't do web fonts. Web fonts are often used just for browsing, for branding aesthetic reasons, but they can be hundreds of K to download. Also, on some really old feature phones, the screens are so rudimentary that the system fonts are carefully optimized for the screen. So we use the system fonts. If you need icons, don't use icon fonts, use SVG. Icon fonts are also really bad for people with dyslexia. Uh, today at, I think, 3.30, my friend Seren Davis will do a talk on how icon fonts affect her dyslexia, which is really interesting. Use progressive enhancements. Use HTML, apply CSS with good fallbacks for gradients and rounded corners, don't require animations, and then treat JavaScript as something that may be there. Do not block people. Airbnb, you all know Airbnb? It's a thing whereby you can let a stranger secrete on your furniture and they'll give you $20. Um, they launched, anybody from Airbnb here? They launched their new Holy Grail app. We're so excited, they said. It looks exactly like the app it replaced. But the initial page load feels drastically quicker. What was their secret magic, you're asking yourself? <gasps> we serve up real HTML. Instead of waiting for the client to download JavaScript before rendering, it's fully crawlable by search engines. It feels five times faster. Who knew? Smartphones. Smartphones are taking over the world. If there were a sci-fi movie called Rise of the Smartphones, this would be the poster. India and China and the States are the biggest consumers of smartphones, of course, they're the biggest countries. But the Middle East and Africa are also seeing unprecedented growth, and feature phones are being hit hard. So at Opera, we were a little bit worried. We wrote Opera Mini for feature phones, but feature phones are declining. Are we gonna lose market share? And the answer is no. And the reason is this. This is the first 100 Android devices that you have never heard of that were released in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh with Opera Mini pre-installed. Why are manufacturers of smart devices pre-installing a proxy browser that was meant for feature phones? It's because of this, Bruce's law of smartness. Doesn't matter how smart your phone is, if your network is dumb. Smartphones are very cheap now, but infrastructure takes decades to upgrade. This is taken out of my apartment window in Bangkok. That is what infrastructure looks like in Southeast Asia. We started late, so I'm gonna go fast. There are also problems demand side uh, getting people onto the web. One of the problems is smartphone sales are either flat or declining last quarter, depending upon which report you read. That might be because China slowed down. It might be because of classic economic saturation. Everybody who can afford a smartphone already has one. And it might be because of this guy. This guy was given to me uh, last month at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. This guy is Jules Sim. It has web connection, and it retails for $2.36 in Africa. So, and they told me that if I buy 10,000, they'll do them half price. So, yeah. So for many people in sub-Saharan Africa, for whom even $60, $100 for a smartphone is unachievable, or people in Cambodia, where the average wage is $80 a month, this might just be enough because it can connect 
to the web. There's also a problem, seven out of 10 people in Africa who were uh, asked why they don't use the internet said they don't see the point or they don't know what it is or they don't know how to use it. In high income Poland and Slovakia, 20% of people don't know how to use a computer. In America, 41% do not have the internet. There's a real digital divide for older people. My friend Paul was doing tech support for his mum. What buttons are on your screen? A hot water bottle and a dentist chair. Here is, I've edited this down so it's not too painful. This is from a, an organization I have friends in called Club Internet in Pakistan, and they do usability testing. This is one of their subjects. He's in his 20s, he's literate, he's asked to search for his favorite actress on Google. Uh, He's literate, he was a feature phone user, he's heard of the internet, he's never used the internet, and he's never used a smartphone. His big trouble is, he doesn't know how to call up the virtual keyboard. As simple as that. He's not a stupid guy, he just has preconceptions from his feature phone days, so he cannot use the smartphone. I'm very grateful to Club Internet for letting me show that. However, people with no preconceptions do not have a problem. I met this seven-year-old Cambodian kid on the beach in January. I don't speak any Kaima, so I mimed instructions. Within one minute, he'd taken this selfie of himself on my Nexus. Change is possible, according to the parking meter in Chinatown in Birmingham. Developing countries are home to 94% of the global population. There's a digital divide, yes, between rich and poor, rural and urban, old and young, women and men. The day I landed in India in February, the Times of India published a report. The number of rural Indians between December 2014 and 15 grew by an amazing 93%. Ooh. But that growth of 93% means that a staggering amount of 9% of rural Indians have access to the web, compared with 53% of urban Indians. This is why on Republic Day in India this year, we launched Opera Mini in 14 different Indian languages and scripts to make the web available, or to make browsers available in people's own language. The World Bank, in their report, say, making the internet universally accessible and affordable should be a global priority. In Nigeria, the data to watch online video for two minutes a day costs more than sending a child to school for a month. Think of that if you're showing auto-playing videos. Some countries' digital products are luxury goods, even mobile phones. Last week, there was a grassroots initiative called Fast Africa. Fast stands for fast, affordable, safe, transparent. People all over Africa agitating to get better internet. They asked for fair and transparent ICT taxes, better efforts by governments, agree on affordability, one for two, one gigabyte for 2% of monthly income, invest in public access solutions, and getting women online a top priority. We know that the web empowers people with disabilities, older people, and women particularly much. Across the world, in non-agricultural employment, women make up just 25% of the workforce. But in online work, women represent 44% of the workforce. When asked what the most important advantages are, women said able to work from home and work flexible hours because worldwide women still remain the primary caregivers of children, sick relatives, and elderly relatives. Disappointingly, the most, the most important disadvantage for women was it doesn't pay enough. And more women said this than men, which leads me to conclude that the emerging world is following us in retaining a massive gender pay gap. But it can work. Kudumbashri it stands for prosperity of the family. The Kerala government outsourced ICT to cooperatives of poor women. 90% of those women who are earning more than a dollar a day, which is okay in Kerala, are women who never worked outside the home before. 
The World Bank say access to the web is critical, but it's not sufficient. I'm not trying to sell you a magic bullet. The full benefits of the web won't be realized until governments improve education, health, business climate, and get rid of corruption and have good governance. But we need to do this. An, in, an increase in internet maturity similar to, similar to the one that we've experienced in the last five years leads to an increase in GDP per person of 500 US. That took us five years. The Industrial Revolution of the 19th century took 50 years to produce the same result. And you here, who are developers, you are the Isambard Kingdom Brunels, the James Watts, the Thomas Telfords, the Thomas Edisons of the internet revolution for the emerging world. So please do it right. Thank you for your time.